are going to pick up where we left off. Uh, we're in Jonah, the book of Jonah, uh, chapters 1 and 2. And I'm going to try to get us there. I didn't use the PowerPoint today, didn't need today, but plan on using it next week, Lord willing. Um, but I want to talk a little bit to get us back on the same page and get our minds and hearts where God wants us. Um, so last week we began our Bible study series, The Lord Great in Power. And boy, through this study, I, my mind just goes crazy in the book of Jonah because his power is just displayed everywhere and in all forms. And there are so many directions that we could go in this, but we want God's direction. And he gave us that today. So this is, um, um, we're studying this, and we learned that, um, <clears throat> excuse me. We learned that Jonah was the only prophet that was recorded in the Old Testament. As we've gone, God called to preach to a Gentile nation. That nation is Nineveh, um, who were the enemies of Israel. Jonah was upset at God's command to preach to this vile, this heathen nation that was so wicked to their very core. His, in his revolt against God, Jonah bolted. He ran, he fleed, and his attempt to flee from the presence of God, which he states several times in the book, just the first chapter, um, Jonah uh, hightailed it to Joppa, 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 I think, found a ship, paid a fare that would take him as far west as possible. And uh, so Nineveh, it, by foot, would have been, it was anywhere from five to 700 miles, give or take, depending on what direction you went to Nineveh, but it was um, a shorter distance when it took about a month on foot. But he says, I'm going to go to Joppa, and I'm going to get this ship and go to Tarshish. This was clear in Spain. And we used the illustration last week. If we was going east to west across the United States, it's 2,800 miles. Where Jonah's going was 2,500 miles. So he was really hightailing it out of there, right? So he was trying to hide. And he states that I'm trying to run from the presence of the Lord. That's what he was doing. So I want to pick back up uh, with Jonah 1, uh, verse 4. But the Lord sent a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was likened to be broken. Now there was a vessel that God was trying to break, but it wasn't the ship. It was Jonah. He was trying to break his spirit, his selfish spirit, his pride, his stubbornness. Boy, is he stubborn. He, he walks a thin line with God. And so he's trying to get him to quit acting in disobedience. By the way, glad to see you two back here this morning. Um, so he's trying to get him to go from disobedience back into obedience, right? So it says, verse 5, Then the mariners were afraid. And they cried every man unto his God. And I just hear that they are pagan worshippers. They don't serve God. And cast forth the wares, the merchandise, their port ship, remember, and were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. And we reminded ourselves that Jonah could care less about this storm. He's hiding, he's sailing as far west as he can, and here he is stuck in the sides of the ship, and we've all been there when we've had those bad days, and we just want to put the sheets over our head, fall asleep, and hope the day just goes away. It's not going away. The storm's still there. So, the shipmaster came to him, and he said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon your God. If so be that God will think upon us that we should not perish. And uh, Jeff, after class last week, brought to me this part here that they're saying, hey, pray to God. And isn't there many that come to us and ask us, pray to God for them? I thought that was a good point that Jeff brought out right there. And I missed that. He brought that up. I thought that was good. And they said everyone to his fellow, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast the lots, and the lots fell upon Jonah. Then, say they, then said they unto him, tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. Which is, well, what is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is thy country? What are their people? Are So here they are. They're coming to Jonah. It's his fault. And they're asking a ton of questions. They know that this evil is upon them, that God has brought this uh, storm upon them because of Jonah. Makes us stop and think for a second. 
I wonder if there's storms in our lives that we have caused ourselves that affect our friends and family members, yeah. right? There's a lesson there that's not for God's goodness. So back where we, uh, this is actually where we stopped last week, verse 9. And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. I don't think he does. He's hiding in the ship. I don't, and he's running as far west as he can, and he's hiding. The God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. He recognizes God as God Almighty, that he is the creator. He knows that he has created this storm because of his disobedience. And yet, he's disobedient, Roxy. I, that's scary to me. That's scary. That's some thin ground he's walking on. Then were the men, this is the mariners, exceedingly afraid. They were the ones that then became afraid. And said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And that is the title of last week's and part two of today's lesson, Fleeing from the Presence of the Lord. And most of us sit here and pray, thinking, well, I'm not fleeing from the presence of the Lord. I'm here. Towards the end of the lesson, let's ask ourselves that question again. God showed us something through this that I found to be pretty interesting. So, verse 11. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempest, there was a great storm. And he said unto them, Take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is on you. So Jonah was willing to die before he would even be obedient to God because of his stubborn pride. I mean, this is some pretty good stubbornness that God's trying to root out of him. Jonah wanted to die. Pride was literally weighing him down into the depths of the sea. And I noticed the word depth in here is mentioned several times through Scripture. That it doesn't matter how deep we are. And to whatever circumstance, God can reach us. We're never too far from God that he can't reach us. Nevertheless, the men wrote, and I like this here. Jonah had no compassion for the men other than saying, just cast me abroad and this storm will stop for you. But they had compassion. And they had compassion for Jonah. They did not want to throw him overboard. I thought that was interesting that these heathens, pagans, as Jonah would see them, these Gentiles, the same people that he doesn't want to preach to, because they are a Gentile, they have compassion on him. I thought that was interesting. Still, not the lesson, but a good thought. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea was wrought in the tempest against them. Wherefore, get this, wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. This is a submissive tone. Praise the Lord. So I was just saying, he looked at you would come in. I'm glad you're here. Yay. So he, this is a submissive tone that he has. Let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it has pleased thee. So they took up Jonah. Now notice, they did not cast Jonah overboard until they had prayed to God. I feel that they knew, okay, God, this is what you want, so we're going to do it. So they cried unto the Lord, uh, uh, or, so they took up Jonah, they cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. God here displayed his power, and yet Jonah dismissed it. However, there was others who was receptive to his power. The mariners, they, they feared God, and it says that in verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. They offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and they made vows. Here they gave their hearts. This is the mariners. They gave their hearts to the Lord. They made vows. They made promises. I'm going to serve you. That's what they were doing. So this storm came. They were innocent bystanders. And yet, they get saved through this storm. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Now many times we sit here and we picture a well. This word does not mean well. It's literally just a great fish. God created this big fish. There's many scholars that try to define the fish. The fish is not the subject. But it's the purpose of what God's using the fish for. 
So the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So in God's preparation of the fish, he displayed his compassion towards Jonah. Jonah was being rescued from the depths of the sea. God rescued Jonah in more ways than one. He rescued him one for the sea. Now the storm was no more. It had ceased. And Jonah is getting ready to tell us in chapter 2 what he faced after he was cast into that sea. But God also rescued him from himself. He was preserving Jonah. He's trying to get Jonah's attention. The mighty storm wasn't doing it. So he's like, fine, I'll send this big fish and we're going to sit and we're going to think about this a little bit, Jonah. So he puts him in this fish. Now chapter 2 is going to recap Jonah's experience in more detail. And I want you to listen to this. <clears throat> because as I'm listening to Jonah, I have seen myself there in times past. Where I have felt where Jonah's at. Not maybe literally being in a fish, but I've been in those dark places, Christy. I've been in those times where I just felt like there was no hope. Stay with me here. Let's slow it down just a little bit. I wanted to get to chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of my affliction to the Lord. And he heard me. He heard me, Nancy. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. He's being repentant here. He's asking God to see him. Out of the belly of hell, here hell is not rendered as hell's fire, but it is... Um, meaning grave or a pit. Jonah here is explaining his near-death experience as one that was in the depths of despair. He was in a pit that he could not get out of except by the mercy of God. We're talking about God's mercy and His grace. Luke sung about it this morning. I heard about it when Roger was listening to the music this morning. I was like, that's what we're talking about, Lord. Your grace and your mercy. But Jonah was in a place of darkness. You picture him in that fish's belly. For thou hast cast me into the deep. He knew it wasn't the mariners. He wasn't blaming the mariners. He knew whose fault it was, his own. He knew that he had caused this storm to come upon his life. He knew what his problem was. But he couldn't bring himself to trust God for the purpose that he sought him to do. So, thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. And thy billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. He's having faith. He's wanting to turn back to God. He goes back here to explaining when he was in the waters. The waters compassed me about, we're in verse 5, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. Yeah. Yes, he did. I went down to the bottoms of the mountain. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Here he is again talking about the grave pit. He felt himself dying. And that's what he was talking about, the bars of death. He felt like he's in the prison of death. Now... Maybe Jonah couldn't swim, even though, remember, God calmed the raging sea. But he was still in the great sea. So even the waves itself is still enough to take one under. We know that. Now, maybe he couldn't swim. But I don't think that was the case. I think he let himself go. Because we see that even in the storm, he was trying to hide from the storm. He was, casting, he was willing to be cast in the raging sea. He had assumed his self to die rather than go preach to a vile nation, forgetting that he was once vile himself. The message there that will be in to next week's lesson, so we'll move on before I talk too much on that. But, says my, he said, with her bars around me forever, yet hast thou brought up my life 
from corruption. You have brought me from that pit. You have brought me from that grave. You have brought me, Lord, from that destruction. He knew that the fish that had swallowed him, that God preserved him, even in his disobedience. Because from what we understand, he was a prophet. So he must have been previously obedient to God's will for God to call him for this purpose, right? But he's having a moment that he just can't get past. But God says, I have compassion for you. I have this for you, but you've got to listen to me. God, trust me. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee in thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee the voice of thanksgiving. He said, like, Lord, I'm going to praise you. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Lord, if you want to save these wretched people, that's up to you. You saved the mariners. You saved me despite my own self. Lord, I'll be obedient. Until we see next week's lesson. We'll hold that thought again. These little teasers here. And the Lord spake unto the fish. Do you believe that? Yes. The Lord spake unto the fish. And it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Now, as children... We often think of the story of Jonah being about a fish. Just natural. That's the first thing that comes to our mind. The story of Jonah is not about a fish, but rather a powerful testament of God's grace and his mercy. Grace. I know we know this, but I want to go over it again. Grace is giving us something that we do not deserve. It is unmerited, undeserved favor. We do not deserve his love. We do not deserve his compassion. His forgiveness, his faithfulness, his goodness, and we could talk all day on that alone, couldn't we? Mercy is not giving us something that we do deserve. It's withholding punishment. We are deserving of eternal punishment, but in God's mercy towards us, Christ took our place. In fact, God sent his only son to come on the cross and die for our sins. And for your sin. So this is a true account of Jonah. And God has displayed his power of love in the form of redemption and second chances. That's what this is about today. I'm glad he gives second, third, fourth yes, chances. Yes, amen. amen. But we better be careful. Yes. Because we tread on thin water. His grace can run out, and we've seen that in the Bible also. So we witness God's grace towards Nineveh when he commands his prophet to preach to the wicked city and offer them salvation. We see God's mercy come to the pagan mariners that were on the boat who were innocent bystanders in God's wrath towards Jonah. Also God's grace when he forgave them of their sin. Grace and mercy. Mercy and grace. They go hand in hand. God's grace and mercy comes upon Jonah, the rebellious, disobedient, stubborn prophet. God sends a storm of warning. I love warnings. And I'll tell you why. Because then a warning is an opportunity to turn about, to come back towards God. That's why he sends warnings. No matter how fierce they are, he says, I'm giving you an opportunity to turn back to me, to trust me with whatever you're going through, whatever it may be. Whether you caused it, sin caused it, whoever caused it. I'm giving you an opportunity to trust me, he says. To turn towards God. That's God's grace. He demonstrates compassion. God sends a big fish to rescue Jonah and holds him safe until he comes to his senses. Thank God he holds us until we come to our senses. That's mercy. God hears Jonah's cry and he forgives him. God's grace. So Jonah quotes, I want to go back up to the second chapter, verse 8. I kind of read it quickly. And I kept reading this over and over and over in the studies. And I was just like, God, there's something there. I know you want something from the scripture. I don't know what it is. And it was this morning that you gave it to me. So go back up to verse 8 of chapter 2. He quote, Jonah quotes this impactful statement in verse 8 when he says, They... 
that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. I want to dissect this for you. Anyone that knows me knows I love words. I love dissecting words. I especially love dissecting Hebrew and Greek words because there's always deeper meanings that we don't understand in our English. It's always a little deeper. Lying here is pretty straightforward in the first sense of the uh, definition to where it's something false, empty, not true. It's worthless. You can't count on the lie. It's false, right? We hold to the truth of God, right? But looking deeper into the root word of this word in this scripture, in this context of lying, and what Jonah is saying here, it is a meaning to me, rush over, as in to rubbish, such as a storm to rush over. A devastation, meaning something to come up on a person in such a way that it overwhelms them. And if you notice, in a storm, we can't help some storms that come. And sometimes we cause the storm. But in those storms, we can be trusting God. But if there's something negative that starts to take root, if we're not careful, we'll start har harboring and holding on to that which is not true. That which is the devil. He can get a foothold on you. He will. And that's where we're on dangerous ground. And when we start focusing on those things of negativity, then we risk being out of the presence of God because we're holding on to that opposed to the truth of what God has for us, opposed to his promises of I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let me back up here. They that observe lying vanities for sake their mercy. So those who focus on that storm, that's what he's saying. The negativity in the storm. Who, who grasps hold of that storm and focus on that. That's what he's saying. And then it says vanities. Vanity here in this context means vapor. It's a breath. A vapor. It goes away quickly. <laughs> it means to act in, to be um, an action of emptiness and word or expectation. Specifically meaning to lead astray. So, in many translations here, the word vanity is replaced here with the word idol. Hold on to this. Just bear with me on to try to get this thought across. Idol. Now, when we talk about an idol, we automatically think of this statue, right, that's being worshipped. We also have talked about it in the many sense that um, an object or a person becomes an idol or a sport or whatever. You can fill it in, right? But I want you to think of something else as an idol. Because this is what Joan is saying. This idol, what he's saying, when you're going through the storm and you're focusing on that stuff that is empty, the things that the enemy tells you, the things that are false, the things that are, are not, that are worthless. When I throw something away in a trash, Roger, it has no use to me. So as Christians, as believers, those things that I want to throw away is the devil's lies, that I'm hopeless, that God can't help me, that, that I am out of God's reach. But here's the problem. Sometimes in that storm where we're so tired, Nancy, yeah. of going through the storm. Now, we're human. We can't always be up on the hop. If you are, wow, you're a better Christian than me. But we get tired of the battle. And if the enemy can get in and whisper just that little bit of doubt, we may hold on to that. And then maybe someone comes along that's maybe not in the spirit, says something that upsets you. You hold on to that, Bonnie. Next. Well, Lord, maybe 
He wasn't pouring big either. You know, we're going to do grace for a while. Yeah, and that's true. Rough. Your mom. Yeah. <laughs> your mom. You're a good praying mom. Tell yeah. me that. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. That we hold on to those doubts and that negativity <coughs> or something that tickled our ear in the wrong way. And that becomes our idol. Anything that we hold above God becomes an idol. Even in our doubts, our negativity. Think about that for a minute. That's what God said. I never really thought of that until this scripture came to me and God said that to me. That our thoughts can become an idol if we hold it above God. Something to think about. And that's what Jonah was saying. So have we placed, this is, so like I said, it could be a person, an object. Place them whatever expectations. Are we in our own expectations? Are we holding on to God's expectations? Which is the truth, His truth. So have we placed our circumstances, our disabilities, our diseases, our bad reports, our lost jobs, our broken relationships, our barrenness, our depression, or our seemingly hopelessness above God. If we are, then that's become our idol, and God says, I don't want that. I need to bring that out of you. You need to trust in me. So he may cause even a more of a deeper storm to get you to come to your senses, to get me to come to my senses. Now, I wasn't going to tell this. I always want to break my house and go through storms. I'm telling you, it's always for a purpose. And I think he gives me these storms so I can teach about them. And then that's, okay, Lord, whatever you want. I haven't been in a fish's belly. Thank, thank you, Lord, for that. Don't want that. But I, um, I won't go into the whole detail, but I, the autoimmune disease I have, I have to eat certain foods. And whatever I eat seems to cause more inflammatory things. And when I get so inflamed, I've got inflammatory cells in my blood. So I swell, and then I'm in such a pain that I can't um, function. And no pain medicine can take it away. And I hurt so bad that it like cripples me. I can't hardly move my hands. I can't do nothing. And so I've missed a lot of services lately. And I told you at the beginning of the year that I come a hair and it's coming down because I thought maybe I should focus. God said, no, my grace is sufficient. We're going to get through this together. So I said, Lord, I'm going to trust in you. But the other day I've been on this certain way of eating. I won't go into that. I was trying to fast forward to when I was in the fish's belly. And it's to the point that no matter what I eat, it causes pain in my body. And I broke down. I had a breakdown. I said, Roger, I said, I can't eat anything. I can't enjoy food. To the point that I went to the grocery store last week and I had a panic attack in the middle of Kroger. Because I just walked around the grocery store afraid to pick up anything to eat. And I know that sounds silly, but that's where I'm at with my health. I don't know where to go, what to eat. I said, Lord, I'm trusting you. And I had a pity party, Christy, for about two days. I was at my wit's end. I was in that dark place. I was starting to hold on to those things that were false. The things that God didn't tell me, but the enemy was telling me. That there's no hope for you, Tanya. Your health, your health is not going to get any better. And it may not. God may heal me in heaven. And so I really am fine with that. But he needs to give me the strength to get through every day. I'm human. So, God showed me, Tanya, you need to trust in me. You need to trust in me for your healing and for what I'm doing. So I'm asking, God is asking, what is it that we're placing in our lives and holding it above the truth and the promises of what God has for us? So, Jonah was saying the same thing. I can't hold this above you. I have to trust in you, Lord. I have to trust in you. So Jonah's experience in the fish's belly, I'm sure, was unpleasant. I think don't, but it's true. Christ himself mentions it in the New Testament. And in that fish's belly, imagine it pitch black because there's no light. There's no holes other than this end and that end. It's not a well. We distinguish that. So his escape is only out the mouth or the back end. It's going to be hard to do if it's pitch black. And then I want you to picture the smell of that fish. I guarantee you he probably never ate soup.
sushi again. Because I don't think I would. But it's a stinky place to be. And when we get in these dark places, it can reek because it overwhelms our soul. We feel like we're fainting. We feel like the waves are coming above us. We feel like we're drowning. And we feel hopeless. And the devil, if he can take an inch, he'll take a mile because when we start going that way, and especially for those who are not Christians, and we see Christians here that we pray with the thoughts of where they were going. They didn't want to live no more. We've heard that so much the last two years at the altar that it scares me. I've heard it in my own family. I've seen it happen in my own family. Happened recently in our family. Or at least an attempt to, that God's compassion and His mercy, He's got a warning and an opportunity. But we put ourselves there when we don't trust God and we'll go. So, have we lost hope of getting out? Because there's only two ways out our way or God's way. And our way is not really going to get us out, is it? Just one puts deeper into the pit, deeper into the sea. He said, I sunk to the bottom of the mountains in the ocean. There's mountains in the ocean. He went to the depths. He thought he was dead. God said, well, let this fish take you. Then let's sit and talk. Three days, three nights. Let's talk about this, Jonah. Let's talk about this, Jamie. Let's talk about this, Tanya. Dark place, stinky place, it breathes. It's a place of seemingly hopelessness, a place of doubt, negativity. It's wasteful thinking. It's a wasteful attitude. But let me read you Lamentations 3, 22, 23, one of my very favorite verses. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Praise the Lord, Jeff, right? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, day, morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God knew the heart and condition of Nineveh. He knew the heart and condition of the mariners. And he knew that of Jonah. He knows the heart of us. He knows. And why we're studying this, the Lord, great in power, looking at his power, one thing that marvels me of his power is that he's an all-knowing God. He's an all-knowing God. He knows the very head or not on your head, right? He knows how many of mine are gray and how many Demi covered the other day when I got my hair done. I come home, Roger says, you look younger. Thank you, honey. I love you, too. Tanya, can I tell you something that happened this week? Yes. God's telling me. I take care of Poppy and Elaine. Of course, Poppy Elaine's in the school, so it's just me and Poppy on Tuesday and Thursday and other, every other. Well, Elaine is home on Friday. But, you know, I go about doing everything. Poppy likes attention. She likes to be set. But I sat down, picked up my phone, started looking at Facebook, and she come in and took that phone out of my hand and turned it off. Turned it off and says, No, 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 me. So, how many? I know that we're all older, but we're guilty. Yeah. I'm real of putting that before God. Yeah. I could read my Bible at night and I play games. Yeah. And God was telling me right this second. Yeah. That's one of the things that we're putting before Him. Kids tell us that they got off Facebook because the adults took over. That's what that's what I hear from the kids. Yeah. So God knew the heart of all these situations, and yet His power, He worked with all of them. But in examining God's power and knowing that He is an all-knowing God, do 
you believe that God knows where you are in your situation and that he loves you, I want you to read, I want, I want to read to you David's Psalm in 139. And I love this. I told, we was watching, um, what was we watching? The Chosen. And they mentioned this scripture. I, like, I just came across that scripture. That's so cool. Blah, 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 blah. But I was reading this, and it just hit home for me here. But listen to this. Psalms 139, 1 through 12. O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and know me. Thou knowest my downsetting and my uprising. He knows what we're doing. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down. Thou art acquainted with all my ways. Oh boy, he's got a lot of work to do on me, I'll tell you. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go? Listen to this. Whither shall I go from your spirit, and where shall I flee from your presence? We're just talking about Jonah, was we not? David's saying the same thing. Where can I go to get away from your pleasant presence? Where can I run off to? Yes. If I ascend up into heaven, there you are. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. You ever remember that term? I always remember my parents say that. Make your bed, you lie in it, right? If I take the wings of the morning and dwell to the uttermost parts of the sea. Now, no matter how far I sail across the seas, you're there. Even there shall your hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be as light about me. Woo! So we're not children of God. This scripture just said, I'm children, a child of light. Even though I go through dark times, God says this doesn't matter because I'm your light. Amen. Repeats it again in verse 12. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. He can take our dark days and make them bright. He, there's, he gives us hope. The darkness and the light are both a light to thee. It makes no difference to God because he is in control of everything. So what God is saying, I see you. I know you. I love you. And I want to help you. But here's the thing. God often extends his hand and then we try to get away. Do we not? I've been guilty of it. I see you, I know you, I love you, I want to help you. And God has proved that. We read the story of Jonah, and I, I, my heart's racing when I'm reading Jonah, because I'm like, I know what happens at the end, but as he's going through it, I feel for him. I'm like, you're walking on very thin water with God's grace and his mercy. Not see. 
see him, saith the Lord, do not I feel heaven and earth, saith the Lord. That's Jeremiah 23, 24. Last one. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. So we can put our expectations in God and not in wasteful things. Okay? I see you, I know you, I love you, and I want to help you. God. Love you all.